Um, let me speak at three levels. The first is to speak about my frustration as a Nigerian. The illusion that we have about free, about peaceful election, first of all, is an illusion because there's no human activity that we can describe as being peaceful. And if you're talking of a multi-ethnic society like ours, where, as we Nigerians have conceded, that 65% of our land is, uh, as the, what's the expression that is being used, is uh, it's not occupied, uh, it's taken over by bandits and so on. Um, I think the, the, the assumptions we have is that the ritual we've been going through of conducting elections, the routine, we've been very successful in the rubrics, but the challenge has been the outcome. And I speak a word I don't like to use, that I am supposed to be a minority because my ethnic group doesn't have enough numbers. And despite my education, as things stand in Nigeria, concretized, you know, you have injustice that has been concretized over time, repeated over and over and over, and it has become embedded in culture. The possibility of either myself or any Christian minority becoming president of Nigeria is almost non-existent. Because had President Jonathan decided to choose Matthew Kuka as a presidential running mate, the immediate reaction will be from the northerners and Muslims, how can two Christians govern Nigeria? Should I, for example, want to run for office as a Christian, and I decide that I want to choose somebody from the south, I'll get basically the same response. And the politicians have just taken it for granted. And it's been embedded in our political culture. And when you're talking about a political candidate from northern Nigeria, you understand what you're talking about. It doesn't include a Christian. Now, you know, the issues going forward about violence, no, every arm robbers like to live in peace. The question that we think we are not framing correctly, we assume that people who cause, use the word problems, are uh, people who don't like the country. The truth of the matter is that we don't like the country we are living in. Because it has, not, it has refused to design the architecture of fairness, equity, and inclusion. If you look at the American Constitution, when it was conceived, there was no place for black people. There was no place for women. There was no place for even white men who were poor. But between 1865 and 1870, just three years, the Americans were able to effect three fundamental amendments to their constitution. Amendment number 13, amendment number 14, number, amendment number 15, which opened the open. First is ended slavery. Then it made it possible for ordinary people to claim equal citizenship. And finally, the 15th Amendment guaranteed equal rights for black people to vote. As, we, as it is in Nigeria today, the whole question of citizenship hangs in a balance and is in suspended animation because we're not common citizens. I will recommend, please, if you have a pen, there are two books that I think you must read, especially those who want to be in power. There's a book called Cast, Cast The Origins of Discontent. It's a, written by an American professor, a, an incredibly beautiful book. But it focuses on why are black people discontented in America? The second book is by Francis Fukuyama, who published in 1989, before the collapse of, about the time the Berlin Wall collapsed, a book titled The End of History. But he's published a little book titled Identity, The Demands of Dignity and the Politics of Resentment. I make the point because in all of this, it is important that if we're going to have a system of political participation that is inclusive, it is important that we understand when, what do we mean when we talk about a multi-ethnic nation. Chapter 2 of our constitution is supposed to be the basis from where all political parties derive the instruments for their manifestos. But in Nigeria, you hear politicians tell you, oh, I, the, 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 the manifesto for my party was written in my bedroom. And yet, in section 15 of chapter 2 of the Constitution, there are certain provisions that are so basic, but Nigeria has refused to pay attention to them. They include, for example, the composition of the government at the federal and the state level, the provision of facilities for mobility, residency rights, 
and the encouragement of intermarriages. But today we are being held hostage by cultures that are inimical to democracy but are being presented as religion. So I, I think that I'm just making the fundamental point that look, we all love democracy. And the unfortunate thing with the Nigerian democracy is that ordinary people love the democracy more than the politicians themselves. Because whereas we stand in the sun, we stand in the rain, and we get killed, but we still go to vote. The politician, as the secretary to government himself has said, the Nigerian politician believes that the only party that is relevant is a, is a, is a wheelbarrow that can wheel him to power. If he misses this one, he jumps to another one. So the lack of discipline by the political actors themselves is what predisposes our elections to violence. Ordinary Nigerians across the board have no problems of religion. It is the manipulation and the systematic manipulation of these identities that is responsible for our violence. Just for the records, this gentleman called Jonathan, you know, after everything ended, everybody, I took the bullets. And I was told that the president had built a house for me in Abuja and uh, I mean in, uh, in Sokoto, everything. But we are people of very short memory. But let me tell you one simple thing that made me say that I can take any bullet for this gentleman. On the eve of these elections, we were, this is something that I think millions and millions of Nigerians may probably never know. I was at the center of the negotiations to get President Buhari, General Buhari and good luck Jonathan together. And we had agreed to fi we fixed a meeting in the villa. The president agreed. Unfortunately, the date of that meeting coincided with the birthday of uh, Ashwaju Bola Tinibu. And General Buhari was not available. And it's a long story, but to make it short, because I think it's very important. It was not until about 11.30 at night, because we kept making telephone calls. I was the one with the, with the numbers. And I finally, I got a telephone text message from uh, Abdul Salam saying to me, Bishop, if you don't, if I don't hear, if you don't hear from me by 11:30, don't call me again. And at this point, we had already met with President Jonathan, but Buhari was upset. Was General Buhari was not at the meeting? The challenge now was that the next day General Buhari was going to have to go to Daura, and the president was going to leave for Delta. That was a Friday. And I remember. We were all scratching our hands. We didn't know what to do. At 8 o'clock in the morning, no, 7, 6 o'clock in the morning, I saw on my phone a text message from General Abdul Salam saying, General Buhari has now agreed to see us at 8 o'clock in the morning. At the, at the, at the Sheraton. We had no reservation at the, the Sheraton. So I rushed, in, I rushed into the Sheraton. And the challenge now was, how are we going to get President Jonathan to cancel his trip now that General Buhari was available? And luckily for me, that day, the day we went to the villa, I remember I stepped as we were going out, I said to the president, Mr. President, please, would you be ready to have a meeting with General Buhari? And he says, yes, yes, no problem, I'll be ready. And then all of a sudden, the challenge now was, how do we get the president? Because General Buhari was now saying he's ready for an 8 o'clock meeting. And President Jonathan had said he was leaving for Delta at 9 o'clock in the morning. So I remember, luckily for me, the day we were leaving the villa, I saw a gentleman whose surname looked like the name of the surname of a priest of, that I knew. So I asked him, I said, is Father Soso and so your brother? I said, no, no, no. I wish I had a brother who is a priest. So I, he gave me his number. I called everybody at the villa. I couldn't get So I called this gentleman. I said, do you know where we can find the president? And he said, ah, president is getting ready for breakfast. I said, can you please go and... He said, ah. I said, please, can you take the micro... I mean, the telephone. Can you tell him I would like to speak to him? And to my greatest shock, the president took the call. We are talking almost a quarter to eight. And then all of a sudden, we have a text message. I mean, we have the full text of the accord that both of them were going to sign. Meanwhile, at this point, General Buhari has turned up and had the chance to read the message. And I was like, how will President Jonathan read, sign a, 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 
an agreement that he has not read. And I remember calling Dr. Ruben Abati. I said, Ruben, do you have your iPad on? He said, yes. I said, I'm going to send you something. Can you take it? They said the president is having breakfast. Can you stand and read it for him? We did all of this in less than 30, 40 minutes. Ruben Abati came back to me to say the president has read it and he has agreed. So can you beg him to cancel his trip to Delta and be with us? The result was the final signing of the peace accord. I make this point because unlike Adam in the Bible, President Jonathan did better than Adam. But whereas Adam said it's the woman that made me eat the apple, President Jonathan said, no, I am the one who decided I didn't want to go on with this. And I think that is a test of character, which is encourage two ingredients fundamental to politics. I want to respond very briefly to the points you have raised. We are looking for politicians we can trust. They don't have, they don't necessarily have to, have to change our lives. I have been very, very frustrated with this government. Not because of, just because of the inability of this government to manage the rich diversity the things that this lady has spoken about. There are very, there's verifiable evidence. People, records are flying around. What is in the NNPC? Who is holding what position? The evidence is so blatant, and yet we know. I come from northern Nigeria. All of us know. It is inconceivable that any Nigerian president could do half of the things that have been done and will get out. But happily, this is coming to an end. The real challenge now is how to rebuild public trust and public confidence. Because whether we like it or not, ethnically, ideologically, religiously, even within Islam or within Christianity, so much fracture has occurred. So yes, we will try and build a new nation. Yes, Nigerians desire a new nation. But it's a, going to be a very painful exercise. And that is why, ordinarily, frankly, we are it not because of the things that this government has done. Nigeria will not be sitting here talking about Muslim, Muslim ticket. But it has become an issue because Nigerians genuinely and grievously feel that, as they say, if you have been burned by fire and you see ashes, you want to run. We didn't need to come to this point in which religion has become an issue and a cutting edge for defining our identity. So I think that, yes, Nigerians will go out to vote. We will do the best we can. But at the end, it is how the politicians share the spoils of successful elections. I think these are the issues, because once the elections are concluded, and Nigerians get a sense that they have, quote unquote, suffered for nothing, it will be impossible to tell Nigerians that we are one united country, we should celebrate our differences. If you receive the big prize, and you decide that your nephews, and your nieces, and your cousins, and your relatives are the ones who didn't even participate in the process, and this, if you use this as a basis, naturally, the system will be volatile. So I just want to say we remain very hopeful. We will continue to encourage our people. But I want to appeal to the political class that there is an urgency of now. When you say that where Nigeria goes, everybody goes. Unfortunately, we are not going to the World Cup. <laughs> so there are some places Nigeria is going that others are not going. But Ghana is going to the World Cup. We are not going to the World Cup. So, But thank you for your comment. But I just think that all of us appreciate how much the rest of Africa and the rest of the world is waiting on us. We are determined to do our duty. Please, the political class, help us to love you, help us to trust you. Thank you very much. Thanks for checking out Symphony on YouTube. Please be sure to subscribe and like our videos for updates.